Um, welcome to the APSAC Zoom chat. APSAC is the American Professional Society on the Abuse of Children, and we are pleased to be able to sponsor and bring to you this series of informal information sharing Zoom chats that were designed to bring you current information, timely resources, as we all face this new reality of living in the times of the pandemic. A little bit of technical information first. Um, we've muted everybody. We will unmute folks during the question and answer time. If during this uh, presentation you have questions, please put them in the chat box. Um, we will ask if you prefer to turn your own camera off when the formal presentation starts, and then we'll turn everybody's camera back on so we can see each other after the presentation when we have the Q&A period. Uh, a little bit about APSAC. We are a multidisciplinary membership organization. Our goal is to strengthen practice through knowledge. And again, like this web chat, everything we do is designed to bring the best information to you, the people serving individuals, families, and communities involved with child maltreatment. Um, please take a minute if you got email today, you'll see that you might have received a newsletter from APSAC. A couple of things I'd like to highlight. First of all, you'll see a link to register for next week's Zoom chat featuring child psychiatrist Dr. Rosalind Murov talking about creative ways to help families deal with stress and anxiety during this pandemic. Now, she's asked us to keep the group a little smaller so we can be a little more interaction. So please hurry up and register now to make sure you get to join us. Also in that newsletter, you'll notice a link to a survey. It's important for us to know how we can continue to serve you in ways that meet your needs. So as you scroll through that newsletter, please click on the link and complete our survey. That really is going to mean a lot to us as we continue in our planning. Also in the APSAC newsletter, you'll see that registration is now open for our New Orleans Colloquium, rescheduled to September 21st to 24th. We've had more than 150 speakers have confirmed, and we're working with the hotel to make sure we enforce all CDC recommendations like line-free registration, social distancing in sessions, and every appropriate precaution to make sure the health and safety of our participants and speakers is absolutely top of mind. So please again, take a look at our APSAC newsletter or hit our website, APSAC.org, for more information on any of those items. Uh, as I do at the top of any of these web chats, I like to share information of what's going on in Washington, things that we might know to help us in our work or to help strengthen our community. Uh, today, I wanted to share there is a new bill, uh, a bill to establish the Office to Enforce and Protect Against Child Sexual Exploitation. Bree is going to put a link out into the chat box so that you can read all about that. It's putting money behind new technology and new services to invest and intervene in child um, in, in in the massive distribution of child sex abuse images online. So that's a bill that you might want to know about. You'll also see a link. I've asked Bree to put out the link for the Heroes Act, the Health and Economic Recovery omnibus emergency solutions act worked hard to get the word heroes into that acronym and it's a federal act that's going to be putting additional money into communities specifically federal hazard pay for first re responders advocates are still working hard to have child protective services included to that list as first responders but please click through the link on the chat box and take a look at that information now also, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi has introduced another, the third uh, round of federal support for individuals and communities affected by COVID-19. Advocates totally expect that the Senate will issue a very different version, but again, keep your eye on what's happening because a third COVID um, Relief Act should be out within the next couple of weeks, and advocates are ver working very hard to ensure that child welfare is included in those acts. So, uh, without further ado, 
having talked a little bit about APSAC. Last thing about APSAC, if you're not a member of APSAC, we'd love to have you join. If you join today and use the code ZoomChat10, you'll get 10% off your uh, membership fee, and you can join our ever-growing uh, group of wonderful professionals dedicated to child welfare and take advantage of our ever-increasing cadre of resources. Uh, now it's my pleasure to introduce the AP APSAC president, Dr. David Corwin, who will introduce himself and our speakers. Thank you all for joining us today. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, appreciate that, Janet. And uh, we're very especially appreciative to our speakers, uh, Sarah Rock and Rachel Gilgoff, uh, this morning. And my uh, only task here. Uh, in addition to, I think Bree's going to ask everybody to put in the chat box what they do. Is that correct, uh, Bree? That's you're going to do that shortly. But um, I'll introduce uh, Sarah Rock is a, an attorney who's the principal at Rock Results, a former child abuse and neglect attorney representing children and the former chief of the California Office of Child Abuse Prevention. She's a prevention and family support specialist. And our second speaker is Rachel Gilgoff, uh, who is a child abuse pediatrician, consultant with the Center for Youth Wellness, and a pediatric integrative medicine fellow at Stanford Medical Center and chief medical officer for Stronger Brains Incorporated. And each of them will share with you whatever else from their background is relevant and helpful to their uh, presentations this morning. So without further ado, thank you very much. And uh, I'll be uh, taking away the sunset off the North Shore of Hawaii as I stop my video. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, David. This is uh, and Janet and, and everyone at APSAC for allowing us to talk today. Can you hear me okay, Bree? Uh, yes, yes, I can hear you like okay. It. Uh, Great. Thank you. No problem. Um, um, and if folks want to privately message me, mm -hmm. um, your uh, roles, uh, so Sarah and Rachel have an idea of that, um, that would be great. And then uh, Sarah and Rachel, I can share with you what I'm getting. Great, thanks Bree. So yeah, we're really grateful for the opportunity to uh, be able to share some information with everybody on the line. And just like Rachel and I are kind of atypical partners, um, we know there are a lot of you out there from various disciplines, but that we're all united by this common um, a sense and concern of for our, our kids out there. Um, and Rachel and I are going to talk to you today about the role of teachers and other school personnel during COVID, which really is applicable to any crisis. Um, we expect there to be other moments in time where children are at home, isolated from their safety nets um, that we're used to. So we think, we hope that this information is applicable to um, other events, um, such as maybe future waves of this, uh, of, of this virus. So we wanted to get together, um, and, and next slide, please. We wanted to, next slide, we can skip our credentials. You guys can talk to us about it if you want to know more about us. But um, we wanted to talk about the uh, problem that we're trying to address. And I think because we are very much in the moment of wondering what was happening to kids, uh, Rachel and I came together because we have like minds when it comes to child abuse and neglect, which is that it's a public health issue that we believe we can really do something about. And when sheltering in place began, and in California, that was March 19th, um, we thought about, well, what's going to happen to these families and these children? And, and how are they going to manage the, this change in not being in school and economic uh, hardship and so on? And we know from uh, even as recently as 2008, the recession, that during stressful times like serious economic hardship, the number of children who are abused and neglect, neglected increases. Um, and unlike the 08 recession with COVID, children are suddenly not in school where teachers, counselors, and other school personnel can see them and, and, and pay attention to what's going on with them. So that, that's a huge difference. So we know it, it increases during times of hardship, and here we have the added complication of being isolated. Um, and most states rely on schools for a majority of their mandated reporting. 
in California, over 50% of child abuse and neglect reports come from schools. Um, and within two weeks after sheltering in place began here, uh, reports were dropping by as much as 40 to 50% in counties across California. Um, and I understand those uh, reporting um, percentages are similar across the nation. So it doesn't mean that child abuse is going down, obviously. It means that the people who are making those reports are no longer in a position to, to see what's going on. So this is concerning. I'm sure it's concerning to all of you. Um, and in one trauma center in California, it's not just that abuse may be going up because we know it happens under these very stressful times, but that the, uh, the levels of violence um, of injuries in, is, is, seems to be worse than usual, that there's new violence among siblings, that there are issues like children being set out on the street. So a lot of new sort of aspects to the abuse and neglect that happens to kids when um, we are undergoing stressful times is occurring. So Rachel and I, along with a lot of other people I'm sure on this call, are really concerned about this. And we thought about, well, this is a situation that's happening now. Teachers, we heard from teachers that were struggling now, and this was about, you know, this was beginning in March because we were immediately aware of it. Uh, the reports on the dropping re child abuse reports began to come in at the end of March, and we wanted to do something about it um, because we wanted to respond to what teachers were saying, and, and they wanted help. So next slide, please. So in an effort to kind of address that, we thought about teachers and how they might need information, and we thought about how teachers are now. So obviously teachers under, are under, like the rest of us, a credible amount of stress, but they were also undergoing having to um, approach their job in a new way. They had to do it from a distance. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit, I'm gonna turn to talk to you a little bit about how we created that tool so you know what it went into it. And then I'm gonna turn it over to Rachel, who's gonna talk to you about really the, the foundation science behind the tool. So just so you know, Bree is going to provide this uh, tool that I'm about to talk to you about as a PDF. Um, it's also on a website link, which is included at the end of the slide, along with a list of uh, scientific uh, references that Rachel has created, which is a gold mine, I'm just gonna say, for anybody interested in this, in this topic. So that'll all be coming to you guys, not to worry if you don't catch it all in these slides. Next slide, please. Whoops, I'm sorry, the last slide was an image of the tool that um, we created or a partial image. It's a front back tool. We wanted it simple. We want it to be eye catching. We did not want it to be overwhelming. So the graphic design of it was very intentional. So I'm sorry, uh, Ilana, could you go now to the next slide? So the reason we developed this is to uh, enforce the safety net for kids in California um, that schools provided. And I think, and then we're hoping, obviously, that it's applicable to any state in the nation that also relies on teachers to the extent we do in California. We wanted to be able to respond to what teachers were saying and counselors were saying to us, but we really wanted to be supportive of the people involved, from the teachers to the students to the parents because we believe there are things that you can do that do make a difference and being using a strengths-based approach uh, and a trauma-informed approach um, uh, to talk about the importance of relational health, for example, makes all the difference. Next slide. So, um, we had a few goals. Uh, we sat down um, and decided what it was that we wanted to do. We are very clear about that and made sure that our work went to that place and, and was targeted towards that. So we wanted, as I said, I mentioned a couple of those already, but that we wanted it to be concise and short so teachers might actually read it, especially, and you're going to hear more about this from Rachel, but especially when people are under stress, Taking in a lot of comp a lot and complex information is almost physically impossible. There are a lot of challenges to that, and teachers, of course, are being bombarded. So we thought, how, what can we give them that's actually going to help? Um, we wanted to be trauma informed. 
Um, and we also, frankly, wanted to slip in very gently a reminder that teachers are mandated reporters. So just because they were teaching from a distance didn't mean unless a state legislated that that way, that their duty changed. And besides a legal duty, um, teachers might need a little help remembering about how they, important they are to the safety of some kids. So we wanted that to be something that they were aware of. Um, and we also, we wanted to get this thing out quickly so people could use it because they need it now. And the sooner we can help mitigate trauma, the more trauma we can mitigate. Next slide, please. So I'll tell you very briefly about how we developed it. We had this idea, we conferred, we talked to a bunch of people. Both Rachel and I have different different types of experience. We, all, we, we both have trauma experience, but hers is medical, mine is more on the public health, social services side. Um, I have a lot of program experience, um, child abuse messaging and mandated reporter training experience. And then Rachel, of course, is very deep um, in the physiology of stress and um, child health, and she can tell you more about how super qualified she is. So we used the, that knowledge base um, uh, as, as we did our research to figure out what else is out there, what do we want to work on, what do we want to create that isn't there, and then drafted something. And, it, and, and as part of that, we also talked to a lot of people. We talked to teachers, uh, school counselors, some fabulous people who are just already on the ground responding to what families were needing. Um, we talked to prevention specialists, principals, um, a variety mental health folks outside the school district, trauma specialists. So just so you know, we talked to people who were already working on developing solutions about their need. And then we uh, circulated our draft among those people to get their feedback. We made adjustments. Um, we did not do as extensive of a uh, stakeholder involvement and testing as we would do in a world where children aren't being traumatized every day and teachers aren't struggling with that issue. But um, we did, our, um, did talk to a lot of different voices that were quite experienced and helpful. Um, after uh, one of the big things, one of the big parts of the tool, and I wanna mention this, we'll talk about it more later, was the um, information that we gave teachers about what they could do if they did have a concern. And that issue of what resources and what's their role with respect to resources is very often a neglected topic of conversation. I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit more about that later, but we didn't just willy nilly put stuff on the facts section of this two page document. Um, there was a lot of research that went into those resources. So um, we distributed uh, lots of wonderful partners, I should say, invited uh, us to share it with them and they distributed it. Dr. Agrawal, who you heard on another terrific webinar here, um, shared it with schools in New York City. APSAC has been graciously sharing it. AAP chapters, um, I think it's in the Library of Strong Families and Communities. We definitely shared it with them. Prevent Child Abuse America. Uh, very cool entities have been um, taking this tool and sharing it or putting in their, their uh, COVID library so that people can find it. And there's more about that later. Next slide, please. So we, um, one, of the, one of the things we really wanted to do was make sure that teachers had concrete steps. So in addition to a resource to refer, refer people to, um, we wanted to help them in what might be their heightened sense of anxiety, vigilance, um, their, their heightened brain state to know what to do when they got a call on a call with video, which is hard for all of us. So when they're trying to manage the children, manage, the tech, manage their students, manage the technology, manage their own stress, something like a child well-being check we thought would be helpful. So on our uh, document, there is a child well-being check. And it has basically uh, two components to it. This is not a whole child well-being checklist. Validated tools like that are, exist out in the world. They're very good. That is not the teacher's role. We just want to give them some concrete advice about what they, what they could ask themselves, perhaps, or keep in mind. So, you know, um, 
those steps are included here. Is the um, child missing Zoom meetings? Uh, are you unable to connect with them via Zoom? Um, have they seen or heard anything concerning? And finally, you know, another suggestion is, what's the child look like? Do they seem more nervous, scared? And, you know, great teachers are watching for this stuff all the time, and they see it in the classroom. And the point of this is mostly about it looks a little bit differently if you're doing a video, if a child is at home, if a child is not being seen. And I think teachers can invent very wise solutions themselves to what they might want to consider when they're trying to connect with their kids from a distance. So that, those are some questions they consider. And then we have some advice about what they can do about what they see or hear or are worried about. So if they believe that a child or family needs support, we're recommending um, that teachers use their existing school resources. So many school districts, but not all, have wellness centers or they have a process where teachers know to refer the family to a wellness counselor, wellness center, the school counselor, school nurse, whatever. There's a process to get the child or the family to somebody who's trained to resource that family. So that's our first uh, piece of advice. You don't need to jump in and start resourcing that family yourself. Use the strong systems you already have. If you don't have a place and you're on your own, then the next best thing would be referring to an entity in the community um, that could include county services, city services, that has expertise in helping families um, figure out what it is that they need, deal with their stress, and then connecting them to resources. So family resource centers, often many good child care centers have this if they're open and running. Um, there are a lot of FRCs that are open and some other community sort of resource places. So that would be the second uh, piece of advice. If you can't use your own wellness centers or referrals, go to people in the community that have those. And you may only need one number. You may have a, an FRC in your school district. You may have a relationship already with those people. You might have another, maybe there's a, a church program. So if you believe, if the teachers believe there's actually abuse or neglect happening, erring on the side of caution, they should file a report following their standard report processes. Those are mostly set up through schools if they're teacher school personnel. If those are disruptive, they can call the county hotline. So you can see that the teacher plays a very vital role here, but we're not asking them to actually figure out what are the resources that would best help that family. We, we want to get them to uh, places that can really, who folk, who do that for a living and who are professionals at it, just like professionals, just like teachers are professionals as, um, as teachers. Um, all right, so let's see. I think at this point, we have more information about what teachers can do, um, and we're going to talk a little bit more about it today, but we also will be sending out, I want to mention here, um, a more developed uh, document um, that provides detailed sort of advice on teachers to help them mitigate stress. So there, there'll be more coming on that. I'll leave, uh, we'll leave you with the resource of where to find that or be notified of that. But at this time, I want to turn it over to Rachel, um, who's going to be talking to you about the foundational science behind this approach, this suggestion of how to work with teachers, um, and she's going to talk to you about the biology of stress. Thank you. Hey, Rachel, so you're can everybody hear me? Um, so I'm going to jump in. I want to echo Sarah's sentiments and just say thank you to everybody on this webinar. Thank you for everything that you all are doing to support kids and families through this pretty stressful time. And thank you to AppSec for hosting us um, because, you know, we are all feeling a collective stress with this pandemic. Um, and I think it's really important to start by saying that not all stress is bad. Um, I think it's important to know that some stress can be helpful. Right, it can raise our heart rate a little bit, get us more energy, raise my blood sugar level so that we can get through a big presentation like this today, right? That we can play our best in the championship basketball game, that we can take measures to be safe. Um, and that stress is what's gonna make sure I, I put on my N95 mask when I go out, right? So some stress can be really good and positive. 
And even if it's a big stressful event, a car accident, a death of a loved one, it can be tolerable. It can actually help us, again, be stronger and more resilient in the end. And that can happen if we have a supportive environment that we're taught healthy coping strategies, if we have someone to lean on in those times. Um, and so what we were really hoping for, um, for teachers, school counselors, school staff, was helping them help make an environment um, where the kids and the caregivers um, in this pandemic that we're all experiencing it as either some stress and positive stress or at, you know, tolerable stress and that the stress doesn't become toxic, right, to prevent child abuse um, and prevent um, the, the, the health consequences. Because um, unfortunately, toxic stress, prolonged activation, unrelenting stress um, in the absence of protective supportive systems can impair our mental and physical health. And so just a teeny bit on how that can happen, because I think knowing these mechanisms actually helps me think of what tools would be helpful for people. And so how does stress become toxic? How does adversity get under our skin? How does it change our biology? And we know that when a scary or threatening thing happens, our nervous system, our endocrine system, and our immune system, they all are preparing us to fight, flee, or freeze in an attempt to survive. And this is great. This is great if we're up against a bear in the woods, but what if it feels like a bear lives at home, right? What if we're under so much stress and in a child in particular, their stress response system is activated over and over and over again? And what if there isn't a protective person who can help that child feel safe and calm down? And we know that the more we practice anything, the better we get at it. And so in the same way, if our brains and bodies are practicing this threat response system over and over again, our brains and bodies get really good at it. Um, and again, that's good in the situation when you're actually under stress, um, but it can get in the way um, in other situations, right? So for example, school. So if I am primed for a threat and stress, then when that kid behind me drops their pencil, I'm now focused on that as opposed to what my teacher is saying on the board. Um, or if a kid bumps me on the playground, I am immediately ready to fight that person, right? Or if a door slams, I go into freeze mode and I sit in the back of the room and I dissociate. And again, I'm not able to listen to what that teacher is saying or learn and my memory is now focused on remembering the pencil and the door slam um, and not remembering the math that's on the board. And in the same way, practicing that threat response system also practices and thus puts a strain on our heart, our lungs, and our immune system. Um, I think we all know those times when we're super stressed and that's when we get a cold. And it's like, oh, why now? But, but the research shows that, that when we're super, super stressed, our immune system is dysregulated and we are more at risk um, for colds. And so what does that mean in times of COVID, right? Um, and so again, it's about how can we keep this from being toxic stress so that we can all stay healthier. So some stress, again, in COVID is good. I'm not saying we need to get rid of all stress. Wear your N95 mask, be healthy. Um, let's just all work together as we're all doing to make it not be toxic stress. Um, let's keep it um, this adaptive life-saving kind of stress and not the maladaptive health damaging kind of stress. And thinking about kids in particular, again, um, they're even more sensitive to this repeated activation of the threat response system because their brains are growing and because they're laying all these new pathways. This amazing neuroplast neuroplastic growth um, can be for good or unfortunately for bad. And so when we were thinking about this tool and thinking about what people can do, we were really thinking about tools, strategies, interventions that can help us keep, keep it from being toxic stress. How can we manage that? And so thinking of this through on the next slide, um, we really want to focus on uh, one of the biggest factors in calming the threat response system, and that is a caring person in a supportive environment. So strong social ties, feeling connected to one's community, feeling that I matter, knowing that someone believes in me, knowing that I have a safe place, um, a relative, a friend, a teacher, a school, a church, all of these things, you know, we're focusing on the teacher, that is going to help calm that threat response system down. And um, 
still on the relational health slide, um, just knowing some biology that, that if we are socially integrated, if we feel connected, if we have that person who believes in us, we actually, studies show we'll live 10 years longer. Um, and in another way of thinking about this, lack of social support or lack of community integration is actually a larger risk factor for mortality in adults than smoking, alcohol, or exercise. And I just want to highlight that because when I learned this, this is from a 2000 study by Holt Lundstrom, and when I learned this, I, it totally changed my thoughts about medical practice, right? Um, smoking, alcohol, exercise, super important, super, super important for our health, right? And as important as they are, social support is even more important to our health. And so again, just a plug to all the teachers, counselors, social workers out there, um, you guys are, are improving mental and physical health in everything that you do to support um, relational health. So thank you so much for doing that. Um, and again, thinking of the pathways about how this happens, how social support makes us happier and healthier is through that calming of the threat response system. So the amygdala actually has oxytocin receptors on it. Oxytocin is sort of that relational, um, good feeling, um, huggy feeling, right? When we hug, we release oxytocin, it lands on the amygdala and calms it down. Um, and so when it's calming the amygdala down, that means it's calming our nervous system, it's calming our endocrine system, and it's calming our immune system. So it's helping regulate all of those pieces of our, our health. And so that's when we get to this next slide, that teachers, school staff, counselors, Thank you, right? Because you guys are not just a source of educational material for our kids, but also this social support system. You're believing in our kids. You're connecting them to resources. You're letting them know they matter. You're giving them that safe place um, where they can help calm that threat response system down. And so the next slide goes into what teachers can do, and we do put this on the tool. Um, we, we thought about creating safety as, of course, first, right? Because if you don't feel safe, you're going you're gonna to activate that threat response system even more, and you're going to pile on top of all the other stress that's happening from the, the crisis. Um, so create safety. And then, just as I was saying, provide that social and emotional support. So how can, how can families and, and teachers and school systems do that? And prioritizing health and well-being. And then recognizing children and families who need additional support. So just going through those a teeny bit more, um, the next slide we just added because it's some great funny pictures of all the great work that schools, uh, school staff, the front desk, counselors, teachers, they're, they're all doing and the creative ways that they are helping and supporting families and kids. Um, so again, thank you. And so then the slide after that, we're talking about creating safety. Um, and just to I, I want to make sure we, we have time for a discussion, so I'm going to go through it quick, but I'm happy to talk more about any of our thoughts on these um, in more detail. But when we were talking about creating safety, that's about being available, being compassionate, offering those Zoom office hours, really connecting with kids, thinking about trauma-informed practices and, and becoming a, a trauma-informed school. There's a lot of great resources for free, um, free uh, education on how to, if your school isn't already trauma-informed, doing that. Um, creating predictability, we know that what's super stressful um, about a stressful event is the unpredictability of it, the unknown, and um, part of that's with COVID, like we don't know when the schools are going to open, we don't know uh, if we're going to get sick, right? So anything that we can do to create predictability will help us feel more safe, and anything that we can take control over um, will help us feel better too. So trying to give students a little bit of control over their workload and their environment can go a long way. And then the next slide, we do try and we did try and think of some kind of concrete things that teachers can do to support both caregivers and students. Um, and you know, the support for caregivers, we were really talking about um, helping connect with the caregivers um, and setting some clear and manageable expectations for the caregivers. How much do you want them to be helping uh, their kids with with the homework, and what's a reasonable expectation for that? Because you know, again, we don't know what's happening at home. We don't know if the caregivers lost a job, if they're suffering um, from COVID itself. Um, and so not placing too many extra burdens on caregivers because that'll decrease the stress in the home and decrease the risk of, you know, child abuse and neglect, which is what we really um, were aiming to do. And engaging the parents, um, you know, my, my 
Daughters Teacher actually organized a webinar, a Zoom webinar for the parents, which was really nice and helpful. So things like that. Um, and then social support for the students. Um, we've talked a lot about that. And again, we have some resources in, in the two pager that we can talk about more in depth. But, but just again, thinking about um, letting kids know that you believe them, that you're there to support them, um, reaching out to the students who may not be uh, joining the Zoom calls, um, helping kids connect to each other. So thinking about group projects or having those Zoom calls so that the kids can talk to each other. Um, we heard a lot of advice about considering safe words. Um, so when you're doing those Zoom calls, um, giving kids a, a safe word that they could say um, that, that you would then know that they need some extra support. Um, and then also providing, you know, letting people know that there is a way to do private chats um, in the Zoom so that the students could talk to the teacher directly if they needed to. Um, and then one of my second to last slide, and then I'll turn it over to Sarah, um, is again, decreasing stress. So not all stress, we can't take all stress away and that's not the goal because some stress again is good, but really um, considering that if we are so stressed out that we've flipped our lid, which is a Dan Siegel um, and Tina uh, Price and saying great, Whole Brain Child is a really great book. Um, if we have flipped our lid, we're not thinking clearly as much. Um, and so if we're super stressed out, again, cognitive ability, the ability to learn, the ability to remember things is, is gone. So it, it really, we're all connected, right? The teachers, the counselors, the medical, um, the public health, it's all the same shared pathophysiology. Um, and so if we can help students feel safe, feel more calm, then they'll actually learn better. <laughs> they'll have better executive functioning skills and they'll have better academic success, right? And so one way to think about that is prioritizing social emotional learning. Um, and so a lot of teachers already know about a Castle, the Collaborative for Academic Social Emotional Learning website, um, great resources. So that'd be one way to, to do that, to make those connections. Um, and then promote healthy habits. Again, we're all connected. Um, it's just health. Um, so the education system, the mental, physical health, we're all, we're all about health. Um, we're all linked. Um, so again, thank you for everybody, everybody's work on this. Um, so thinking about even in a school, um, and a lot of schools are doing this great work, um, connecting kids to um, physical activity. Lots of PE teachers are posting really great stuff. Um, so it's amazing. Um, a lot of dance classes and gymnastic classes are posting their stuff online. So it's really amazing. Getting kids out in nature. So encouraging them to take walks, but still being um, socially, yeah, physically distant. Um, and so just two general big things about this. One is considering uh, looking into habit change theory, and again, I can talk more about this if people are interested, but it's hard to do these things. It's hard at baseline. It's even harder to do them when we're super stressed out. So thinking through um, some habit change, there, there's a lot of great work. And just a, an easy way to think about it is you want to make things that are um, uh, not as healthy. You want to think about ways to make them a little bit harder to do and the things that are healthy to make them easier to do. And you plan that when you're not stressed out. So that, for example, um, when I'm super stressed out and all I want is chocolate, I've already put the chocolate on a high shelf so that I have to do a little bit of extra work to get to that chocolate. And in that time, I've also put the fruit in a lower space. So I see the orange and I go, ah, okay, I'll have an orange. And it's nice that they get rid of the chocolate, right? Because sometimes the stress is so bad that it's, it's worth it. It's worth going to that top shelf and getting the chocolate. So that's kind of the habit change theory, which is really great and helpful. Um, and then second thing I just want to point out about this list is the breathing. Um, only because when I first learned about breathing and breathing techniques as a trauma intervention tool, I, I will fully admit that I rolled my eyes because I was just thinking, I was imagining myself in a stressful situation. I was imagining talking to families in these stressful situations and telling them to breathe. Um, it just seems too simple. But I will say I've come around um, for a number of reasons, but one of them is that physiologically speaking, when you take a long, slow exhalation, your heart rate goes down. I mean, it, it, whether you want it to or not, it just does. So um, if you practice these breathing techniques when you're not stressed out, such that when you are stressed out, you can take those moments to take a long, slow exhalation, you are actually physiologically lowering your heart rate, which can have some really profound effects. So just leaving with those thoughts, I'm totally happy to talk 
more about specific ideas and tools. Um, but I wanted to end my little piece on um, this next slide, self-care. I have a feeling everybody on this call really knows about this stuff, but um, all the cliches, self-care is not selfish. Put your own oxygen mask first. You can't pour from an empty cup, so you gotta take care of yourself. They're all really, really true. And so we did highlight that on the teacher tool as well for the teachers and the school staff that, um, you know, if we flipped our lid, then we can't be there and available for our, our kids and our families. So um, take care of yourself. Um, so I'm gonna turn it back over to Sarah. Thank you guys so much. And then Sarah, I think you're on mute. So I am. Thank you, I had two mute buttons. Um, so I just wanted to say um, thank you, Brian, and uh, Dave for suggesting people put in their profession or their roles. Uh, we got a good sense of who's on the call. And um, so feel free, and we look forward to having a little bit of time for question and answer. But a lot of people from the school's community, which is great. Um, and we do have a lot more information, as Rachel said, about what teachers can do if you're interested. So uh, we can share all of that later or down the road and uh, particularly in this next tool that we're going to create or, or document that we'll be sharing widely with people. Um, I want to just take a couple minutes because we do want to leave time for question and answer uh, to talk about support for families. So I, I want to start with saying that you don't have to do it all if you're school personnel, right? If you're a teacher, counselor, it just, that's just to me so unfair. Um, it's not compassionate. You have a role, you need to do it to the extent that you feel like you need to do it for yourself personally and professionally. But I think there's a tendency for a lot of us to expect teachers to continue to do more and more and more. And particularly in this crisis of COVID, I think that puts you at risk of uh, overdoing it, burnout, feeling discouraged, and which is why Rachel's point about self-care is so critical. So you don't have to do it all. One of the things you don't have to do is technically you don't have to support families, but for those teachers for whom that is important, we just wanted to reiterate how, what an impact you can have and what a lifeline you can be. And just like you're a hero to the children, you can be heroes to the families. So um, I think that if you're going, if you're in a position and have the capacity emotionally or brain-wise or whatever to think about the family and if they're appearing more to you because you're on video and you're in their living room now, then here's a few sort of suggestions about what you can ask. Um, and they're supposed to be numbered one through four. <laughs> Something happened there. But what you can um, ask the family, you know, are they open to support? And just like we put in the well child check, uh, child well-being check, the, the process is the same. Exist, it, refer them to your existing services. So one of the best things you can do is use your relationship and your connection with that family who might be struggling to get them to people whose business it is to help them with those issues. So your role, I want to emphasize as a connector, a facilitator is absolutely critical and vital, but you don't have to actually do the work. And I know the reality is a lot of, a lot of folks do, and you may not have those resources. Um, and thank you for doing that because you are a lifeline to them as well. So uh, just wanted to mention that to everybody because I think there's a natural tendency for people to say, you know, protect the child, help the family, and that is a lot harder than people realize, I think, when they have that expectation. Um, but if you do see things and can help, you do play a vital role. So next slide, please. Um, I wanna say just a little bit about hotlines and warm lines. This kind of connects to, to the help for families. Um, and we, I have tons of information about what you can do for families if you want to do that, but we didn't want to imply that that was your responsibility or that you have to. More that if you can make connections for those people, that's awesome. But, but we can help with this with some additional information. But the referral to hotlines is an important one because especially now with COVID, 
they're being thrown out all the time and um, they aren't all very helpful. So I just wanted to take this moment to sort of uh, share these thoughts with everybody on the call that if you're at a school, hopefully your school has some tried and true numbers that you use that are local numbers that can connect to local resources that are culturally appropriate, um, linguistically appropriate. If you don't have a number that you can refer to and you trust, there are some general national numbers that do this for a living. Child Help is one of those. They have 170 languages available. They now also have text. People still prefer to call. Teens prefer to text but it, uh, parents prefer to call. So they have a phone number and a text line that people can use. So if you're at a loss, you don't know where to send people, you're really worried and you wanna tell a family where to go, you can recommend that. Um, but as I said, if you have a local number, you can also, I mean, if you don't even know the local number, you could do a little research and have that in your back pocket. Um, and that connection to that hotline or that FRC, if you have a human on the other end of that, is incredibly powerful and does help mitigate stress and helps reduce child abuse. Um, and we know that factually. So um, a, a word of caution that um, you don't, you want to avoid getting caught up in a problem where, it, excuse me, in a situation where you're trying to resource uh, uh, families and, um, and meet their needs when that may not be what you're trained to do. Some, some teachers are, but not all of them. Next slide, please. Um, so what's next? And then we're going to turn it over to question and answer. Ooh, hopefully we have some time. Um, here's the slide. I'll leave it to you to read. But basically, we will do another version incorporating advice, suggestions, and feedback. We, um, because Nina circulated in New York City, we got a great, a great suggestion. I thought that we could add on there that if a child actually puts anything in homework or in their artwork that's indicative of stress, or abuse or neglect, that that's another way, another sign, just like they would in the regular classroom. So thank you, New York City Schools, um, and thank you, Nina, for circulating that. Um, and uh, that I'm going to stop because I do hope we have a few minutes for questions. Um, you will get this slide deck, which includes Rachel's and my contact info, info here, a link to the PDF of the tool, the link to the, which also at that website has the uh, references, citations, and a place to provide feedback. So I'll stop and turn it over to the moderators. Great, thank you so much, Sarah and Rachel. This was um, a lot of wonderful information and we've got a good number of questions. I think some might be good for the two of you to answer and some might be good discussion questions. Um, so I've got them grouped uh, so that we can move through as many as possible quickly and, and uh, we'll see how much we can get through. Um, so first of all, uh, a few folks were asking um, if the process of making a mandato mandatory report is different than if children um, are physically attending school and then with that, um, sort of combined with that, are CPS agencies uh, taking reports of things noticed at home seriously, knowing that they screen out 40% or so of calls and, and um, these kinds of things might be a little bit different what we're noticing in the home environment versus in the school environment. Wow, great question. I'm so glad somebody asked it. And um, I haven't, re is it okay, Rachel, if I answer this as the children's attorney and the mandated reporter mm -hmm. trainer, <laughs> um, that uh, we all know child protection services are, um, are understaffed now. They have their challenges. The whole making them, um, you know, um, uh, essential workers is a really important part of that mobility to respond. But uh, I think the reality from my experience is we cannot expect them to actually take many of these reports that seriously. I'm just going to be honest. I don't have the data for that. We'd have to look at state by state data. Some counties are doing an outstanding job and some counties aren't. So it depends. Um, the mandated reporting law is going to is state dependent and can vary. I haven't seen anything yet, but there may be experts on this call who know um, that um, I haven't seen any emergency measures around the reports because I think that the laws still work. In other words, if you see it, you got to report it. Um, and school districts still, uh, because these mandated reports are in law, 
those laws prevail unless they are lifted. And I haven't seen that happen, nor would one expect it. And they should work, it's just teachers don't see that much. And I didn't say this earlier, but the participation of kids is varying quite a bit depending on the districts and or the income bracket. Um, although it's all over the place and we don't even, we don't exactly know. I've heard some districts say, we only have 25% attendance. And then I have, I heard about an inner city school in San Francisco that's taught by a young teacher, 100% attendance with, her fam with their families, the families they're sitting in. So it's all over the map. Um, and I think the best thing you can do is uh, check the, your state, uh, your child abuse prevention center of your state, your mandated reporter um, law or your entity that does that training, California's the Office of Child Abuse Prevention, to update yourself to get the most current data. Thank you so much. Um, and you touched on something that's been uh, a through line in other questions, and that's reaching students. Um, how do uh, teachers and, and guidance counselors reach students who um, they're, they're providing a, way, a variety of ways for uh, students to get in contact, but they're just not getting in contact, or specifically um, students who are lacking internet access in their homes? Rachel, do you want me to do that too? And then just, sure. or maybe both sure. of us can respond. Let's both respond to this, sorry. So, um, the internet access is a big issue, obviously the equity gap, this is being highlighted right now. Um, the kids we're most concerned about, perhaps their parents are not, it's very deliberate, um, that they don't want them to be seen, they don't want the teachers to have a camera in the living room. Access is a problem. I have heard of teachers doing drive-bys, uh, personally going out to houses, and so on. I think that is Fantastic. So going back to Rachel's point about connections, anything you can do to make that connection is going to help that family and that child. But can you do it? Can you do it in the scope of your job? Or is there somebody who is already supposed to be doing it? Can your, is there a counselor? In, say in Sonoma County, they have school counselors doing that. Um, so I think it's, it's a combination of district-wide responses and some are fabulous and where they're actually sending bodies to the houses to make um, connections. Um, I want to stress that people should be using their attendance rules and laws and follow up. If a child doesn't show up online, it's not showing up at school. And there are attendance truancy rules all over the place that, that, that teachers can use as a, as a way to make contact. So use your truancy processes if they're not punitive and gonna make things worse. Please be trauma informed, uh, but those might help you because if that child did not come to school in the physical, what would you do? You'd probably start helping your truancy folks help make connection with that family that might be at risk. And Rachel, did you have anything to add to that? I'm sorry I've talked so long. No, I mean, I, the only two things I would say, one is I do think that if uh, school staff and teachers are focusing on uh, relationships, on support, then it makes that Zoom call, it makes that connection kind of more of just a thing that the kids and the families want to do because they feel so connected and safe. Um, so they think that would increase attendance. But I also really like, Sarah, yeah. what you said too. Um, you know, this is a systems issue, right? This is not just, it, it's about all of us working mm -hmm. together and connecting. So um, the teacher and the school counselors and the front desk and all the staff and the administration of the school um, really reaching out and coming up with a strategy to reach out to that family if possible, either through phone calls or drive-bys as you're suggesting. Um, and then, you know, the larger connection with the community itself and with community organizations um, to see where each of us can pick up um, and use our, our expertise and our strengths in different areas to, to make it a united front. And I, I think I want to make a pitch here in case we get cut off. Um, uh, I hope there's a little bit more time for questions, Bree, but that what, what I think Rachel and I and a lot of us who've been talking about this issue would like to see is a systematic way to help kids keep kids safe when they're not in school. And beyond that, um, and, and, and beyond that, how do we keep kids safe as communities and not rely so much on mandated reporters? Um, I know Texas, uh, everybody's a mandated reporter. I, that didn't fly in California. 
I don't know everybody needs to be, but just the concept that to me, this is highlighting the need to have people share that responsibility. It's all of our responsibility, not just teachers. That's a tremendous burden to be making over 50% of those reports. So we're going to have future uh, examples of folks in isolation or not in school for whatever reason. And having a way to very competently respond to that, uh, like doing special mandated report trainings, it would be good. Uh, I, I'm gonna just gonna come in here and I wanted to thank everybody again for participating. I thank our speakers, uh, Rachel and uh, Sarah. I also wanna uh, thank Suzanne Frank for sharing her screen. And I, I, I actually find it a lot of fun to see all the people when they turn their cameras on and we can see them at the ends of these web chats. If anybody else is willing to share, please do. And you, you can even turn on your microphones and ask questions or give us some feedback. And Bree, is, could you post the best email address for anyone who wants to share feedback by email about anything we can do to improve these web chats, make them more helpful? I think this was very helpful. And I really enjoy learning from all of the participants of what they have found of value as well through the web chats and, uh, you know, does anybody else have anything that they would like to share before we uh, conclude? We've got everybody up on screen. We have about three or four minutes. We have uh, some people is, up on screen This anyway. is Suzanne. I have a question. You know, I think this would be a great opportunity to do something like Futures Without Violence does for domestic violence, you know, to do the universal education. So when the teacher is talking to the parent, mm -hmm. to normalize it that this is stressful. And, you know, I know they make those little shoe cards for different things, but you could have yeah. one that you could send virtually. But I don't know if Futures has made something for this topic, but something along that line would be good to help teach whoever's working with kids online. You know, I think a nor you know, instead of an accusatory confrontational thing, teaching the teachers how to do the universal approach. I love that idea. Yeah. Great idea. Other too. suggestions, yeah. other things that you have uh, discovered while coping with COVID-19 that you'd like to share with the people on this call? This web chat, whatever we call it. <laughs> Hi, this is Cynthia Henderson. I'm a school social worker practitioner with NASW. I've been talking with some of my social workers and one little quick snip that they gave for assessment is called CAPS. C is for uh, make sure you have consent. A is for find out the address where that child is. P is for getting a phone number in case you have to make an emergency call and the S will survey the environment to see if that child is safe. Oh, Just wanted great. to share that. Thank I you so that. much. Caps. Good. Yes. Like that, that is so much better than what we have. We, we'll have to talk. That's wonderful. Okay. Well, so we need you. You send your uh, phone number or email to Sarah. Okay. Okay. I'll email her. Uh, yes, please. It's, it's on there. I'd love to see it. Okay. We'll do. Great, okay. Cynthia. Great. Thank you so much. You guys are fabulous. Thank you for doing I just, the amount of caring that teachers have for their students, it's like, oh, it's just amazing. So thank you. Okay. Well, and here we are down to the last minute. So thanks again to everyone. Um, it's, it's been a very interesting time and uh, we appreciate uh, your participation and together we will get through this and go on. So thank you very much. Thanks everyone. Um, if you enjoyed this presentation you. and you're not an APSAC member, please consider becoming an APSAC member. You can do that at APSAC.org and you can save 10% with the code ZoomChat10. Um, I also want to let folks know that we've got a presentation on um, TFCBT for children in foster care with Anthony Manorino starting in just about a minute. So I'm going to share the link to that. If you're looking for something to do in the next hour, we actually have another APSAC event. Um, and thanks again to Sarah and Rachel. This presentation was wonderful. And thanks to everyone for sharing your wonderful resources and asking questions. Um, and we hope to see you at the next Zoom chat.
Aloha. Thank you all. Bye.